Let's get started right away. Psalm 51 is where we're headed. One of the most powerful psalms in Scripture, in my opinion, and I think the perfect opening prayer for our service this morning. So Psalm 51 says this. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. We're actually just gonna stop there and pray. God, help us this morning with what is challenging teaching. Lord, for we struggle in the church to acknowledge our brokenness. God, we struggle to come before you and just be honest and say, Lord, against you and you alone I've sinned and it's wrong and you are right to judge me. You are right if you decide, no, Drew, you, you've done too much. You are lost but we appeal to your grace and your love and your mercy and the promises you have given us in your word and we know that even though we deserve your wrath and your judgment you are kind and gracious and merciful and you show us mercy god but it's so hard because it's hard enough to be honest with you, but when we're honest with one another, so often, even in the church, we don't know what it means to be merciful. We hear people sin, and our first inclination is judge. And it feels almost like we're righteous to do it. I'm gonna call you out, I'm gonna say truth, I'm gonna, I'm gonna condemn you because that's what God would do. And even though it's true that maybe their sin is wrong and they need to repent and turn from it, we don't follow you in that. We don't come with mercy. We come with wrath. And what right do we have, God, to go before others and come with wrath or anger and judgment when we ourselves are guilty? God, that's so hard for us. And so I need you to be with us this morning as we hit this sermon. I need you to be with us and I need you to move through your spirit. I need you to turn our hearts to say, Lord, I wanna be merciful. I wanna be compassionate. I wanna be loving. I wanna be graceful as you are to me. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for your kindness in him. And I pray all this in his name, the name of Jesus, amen. So we're continuing our Chain Breaker series. And we've seen so many amazing things that Jesus has done. Um, In the last few weeks, we started to see a little bit of a shift, right? Jesus went out to the Decapolis and he, he casts out demons from two men over there, but the town comes and instead of celebrating him and the, the casting out of the demons, they cast Jesus out. And then last weekend we saw the, the first little bit of resistance uh, starting to build within the own, their, his own people where they were calling him out and challenging him and the crowds didn't get it and the scribes didn't get it and there was this conflict. And this week we continue with this idea of, of Jesus breaking chains, but, but the conflict that comes from the people who are missing it 
the people who don't see it, the people who don't acknowledge who Jesus is and what his mission is. And I began with this prayer because today we're going to be talking about the idea of Jesus at some point in your life, if you are a Christian, has freed you from something. Now, I don't know exactly what that something is in your life. But when you came to Christ, it wasn't just because, well, I'm just going to throw it out there and I want to be religious. And so Jesus, you know, that sounds cool for most of us anyway. But if you've genuinely come to the Lord, it's because you acknowledged there was something in your life that was wrong and you needed Jesus to take it. You needed Jesus to bear it. You needed Jesus to free you from it. But sometimes those things that we've struggled with, that Jesus has broken the chains off of our arms, we struggle to tell others about it. And especially in the church. Because a lot of the times we feel like, man, if they knew who I really am and how far Jesus has had to go to save me, they might not welcome me in anymore. They might not accept me. They might not feel the same way about me, right? I know this feeling. You may find it hard to believe, but I do. I, you know, as a pastor, one of the things that I, I had as a priority, and I know Brad and Brian do too, we want to be authentic, right? We want to be real. We want to speak truth. We want to be the same people up here that we are when we're talking with you guys, right? Or we are when we're out in the community. And I have always been up front with me and my struggles and my past and my sins. And I've talked about before how the life that I came from that Jesus needed to free me from, part of that was pornography addiction. And that took a huge hold over my life for years. And I've expressed before how Jesus has freed me from those chains and he has, praise God, and he has healed me in so many ways and moved and given me the blessing of having an awesome wife and redeeming uh, my sex life and my ability to think that through in a way that honors him. It's been amazing. But when I've told that story in the past, it may not shock you to hear this. It may shock you to hear this. People have left the church. I've said, this is where I came from. This is where I am. Jesus has freed me. And they said, how dare you talk about your sin? Pastors aren't supposed to do that. Pastors are supposed to be good people. You're supposed to represent Christ. You're supposed to be out there with this image so that other people think you're good. You can't talk about that stuff. And they left. I'm not making that up. They left the church because I said, here's where I was. Here's what Jesus did for me. Here's where I am. They left. Worse than that, I've been accused of all sorts of things after I've talked about that. People have brought to me and said, Drew, if you were addicted to pornography at some point, how can we trust you to go to camp with students? Maybe you're a pedophile. Maybe you're, you have unfortunate thoughts about them and you're gonna do something. How can we trust you if this is where you've been? And, and I've experienced as a pastor the feeling of the Pharisees in the church saying to me, you can't have had sin in your life because you're supposed to be the most holy follower of God that's telling us what to do. My friends, Today is no different than it was then. And I understand the struggle of being honest. But can I tell you something? The more and more I've talked about Jesus breaking the chains of pornography and sin in that way in my life, the more and more men and women who have come to me and been honest with their struggle and who I've been able to pray with and who I've been able to give advice to and who I've been able to give scripture to and who I've been able to say have hope because God can free you from this, the amount of ministry God has done through just being honest, that's how the chain breaker works. He frees you and he tells you, tell your story. Tell your story. People need to hear it because they are going through what you went through now and they need to know that I'm there to free them. But we're afraid of what we're gonna receive in return when we're honest. I wanna encourage you today, be honest. Be open, be clear, be real. Tell people where you've been and where Jesus has brought you because I believe that that has power. What we're going to see today 
is, a, is, is kind of culturally different than our own. And so it's a little difficult to understand, but it's much like what I'm saying. It's somebody who, who has had sin in their life, but who is open and honest and through that changes lives. So let's get into it. Matthew chapter nine is where we are. We're in verse nine. Matthew chapter nine, verse nine. It says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now when he heard this, he said, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now we gotta stop. We gotta go back in the story and we gotta see the details of it because I think it's super important in this weekend. So Jesus goes on there and he sees a man named Matthew. Now we gotta do some red flags here, right? What gospel are we in right now? What book are we in? Where are we reading about Jesus? We're reading about Jesus from who? Matthew. We're reading about Jesus from the person who's being described in this story. So this is an, a, a, an autobiography. He's writing about himself, right? He's saying, I, I, this is when I was called. This is what it looked like. And so for me as a reader, I'm going, okay, red, this is important to the author. This obviously mattered in his life. In the Luke account, he's called Levi, right? In the Matthew account, he's called Matthew. That's because it's believed that Jesus changed his name like he did with Peter and some of the other disciples. And he was initially Levi, but then Jesus renamed him Matthew. But he wants to make clear, this is me, guys. I'm writing about me here. So he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. So what is the toll booth? To put it simply, uh, the way the Roman government operated is they would set up these little I guess you can call it toll booths or toll houses. They're like basically government buildings. Like if you went to the Surprise City Hall and you went downtown and you had to do something, uh, you know, whether it's like a marriage certificate or whatever, there's something legal you needed to take care of. That's what he's talking about here, basically. A lot more went on here than just tolls or taxes. There was a lot going on. It was a really populated area. I mean, listen, every time I've had to go to like downtown and go into one of these offices, it is just the most miserable thing in the world, right? Because there's so many people there and it takes forever and, and they, they are just mean and everything else. That, imagine that feeling, the DMV or any other government building you've been in, that's what he's talking about here. It's a government building. But think about that in a different context, right? What we're talking about here is not, hey, you're living in the United States of America and this is a United States of America government building. Instead, this is, I'm living in Israel and someone else has occupied our country and set up their government buildings in our city. And I'm having to go to that place, right? So <laughs> this is not a fun thing for them. They're not excited to go to the toll booth. And Matthew, being a Jewish person and being somebody who worked at the toll booth would have been considered to be a traitor. A traitor. This guy has betrayed our country. He's betrayed the scripture. He's betrayed God because God wouldn't want this. God wants us to be our own nation. He's gonna send the Messiah to free us. He's betrayed God. This man is a complete and entire outcast. He is hated by his community. He's probably hated by his own family if he has any family. So Matthew is in a situation where he is the worst of the worst to everybody around him. In fact, you might find this funny, but <laughs> one of the things that happens in scripture sometimes, which is kind of funny, is, is the way scribes write things down and sometimes the, they'll make a little adjustments that we'll find later in the documents. And, and one of the things that we saw is actually in one of the earlier passage when Jesus talks about um, even the Gentiles do that, right? Remember we were reading that and he said, if you're nice to those who are nice to you, love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the Gentiles do that. I don't, I don't know if you remember that passage. One of the scribes actually kind of scratched that out and went, tax collectors. And so it's actually a variant in our manuscripts because that's the perspective. The perspective is you are as bad as the outsiders. In fact, you're worse. 
because you are a traitor. So Matthew's a traitor. He's sitting at the tax booth. These people hate him. And here comes Jesus, and what does he say? It's simple. And remember, this isn't private. This is public. There are tons of people here, Romans, Jews, and everybody in between. Follow me. (laughs) As simple as that. Follow me. Friends, that's the invitation to all of us, right? He's saying, come be my disciple. Follow me. But isn't it weird how sometimes people would prefer that Jesus would say that less to the people we don't like? Isn't it weird when we look in our heart and we think to ourselves, man, I really don't want that person to be part of my church because truth be told, I don't want them to follow Jesus. I don't want them to be saved. I don't want them to know God because I got this, this, and this against them. Right, and the crowd in this moment, they're hearing Jesus say, follow me to this, that guy? You're supposed to be some amazing rabbi. You're supposed to be, you're claiming to be the Messiah. You're claiming to fulfill scripture and you're gonna call that guy? The traitor? Matthew, though, hears it, and he gets up and follows him. (laughs) I love that. This is public, man. He's at work. And he says, Jesus, I'm going. A little bit later, verse 10, while he was reclining at the table in the house, so this is Jesus, he's, he's at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Now you've probably heard this verse a number of times, but I want you to notice why this is so important. Remember what I said, this is Matthew's gospel. This is Matthew's calling. This is his story. He's writing about it. He's telling us what happened. He was called. He gets up in the public sphere and he says, I'm following you, Jesus, after Jesus called him. And what's the result? Jesus goes back home with his disciples and they're eating and who's there? All Matthew's co-workers are there, right? All the tax collectors that were there when he was called, they go and they show up. I need to meet this Jesus guy. Why is Matthew willing to give up everything to go after him? I need to go and, and meet him. But not only that, it's the sinners, right? And what does the sinners mean? Well, that's kind of shorthand for the nations, the Gentiles, the other people involved. Everybody around is going, Matthew, You're going, I'm following you. Let's all go meet Jesus. And what's so cool about this passage to me is they came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. So who's hosting the party? Jesus is hosting the party, right? He's at the house. This is his invitation. They've all shown up and he's hosting them and serving them and giving them a meal. And they're all talking and eating and being together. I mean, to me, this is just an immensely powerful scene. And then you get verse 11, right? (laughs) When the Pharisees, right? When the Pharisees saw, they asked his disciples. I don't know about you. When you were a kid, if you had one parent who you felt like always said no, no matter what you asked, and you knew that they were like grumpy and kind of hard to talk to, and so you just went to mom or dad instead. And I think of this moment. He went, they went to the disciples. They don't go to Jesus to challenge him, right? They showed up at this meal that they clearly weren't invited to, right? And because they, and they're hearing this, and they're going to break it up, basically. And instead of being bold enough to challenge the actual leader, what do they do? They say, all right, let's get to his disciples. Let's, <laughs> let's challenge them. Let's get them to, to break. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? How genuinely I wish that their question was genuine. Genuinely, I mean that. Re- read it again. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? That's the question we want people to ask. Why does your God meet with people like that? Why does your God want to save people like that? Why does your God work with people like that? Why is your God doing this? Doesn't he see that they're not good people? Doesn't he see that they're, they're broken? Doesn't he see that they have problems? That's the question we want to ask. 
We want the question to be genuine, right? We want them to go, I'm really curious because I'm also like them and I need a God like that. But that's not their thought, right? The question is right. The thought and the heart is so, so wrong. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, when he heard this, so Jesus overhears the conversation, right? And he jumps in. He said, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Isn't that obvious? Right? Isn't that obvious? Who needs care? <laughs> who needs help? But the people that are injured or hurt or ill or whatever else, right? But why don't we think of that spiritually? Why do we think of that spiritually? Who needs a doctor but those who are sick? Why do we always think that church is for the people that are right? That are good, that are together, that don't need a doctor? <laughs> it's just such a wrong mentality. It's such a wrong mentality. Jesus is so clear. I'm here for the sick, man. I'm a healer. I'm the chain breaker. And if you don't, have, if you don't believe you have chains, how am I going to break them? Right? If you don't believe that you're ill, how am I going to heal? Verse 13, I think it's so key for us. Go and learn what this means. We should do it, right? And we will. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I have to point out just quickly, Jesus is so clearly referencing himself as God, right? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinner. <laughs> he asked, yeah, that's me. I'm saying that. This is my, I, I want mercy and that's why I'm here. I didn't call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. So let's go learn what Jesus was talking about. Come with me to Hosea, where he's quoting from here. We're going to Hosea chapter six. And I know this is kind of tough to get to because it's the prophets and it gets funky and just know that your pastor is also struggling at this very moment because my Bible gets a little stuck sometimes. Okay, here we go. Let's say it's chapter six. Here we go. I want to read the whole thing because you got to get the whole picture, okay? Verse one. Come, let us return to the Lord. So the Israelites, they recognize, right? Man, we've been separated let's return to the lord for he has torn us and he will heal us he has wounded us and he will bind up our wounds he will revive us after two days and on the third day he will raise us up so we can live in his presence a it's a pretty obvious jesus connection don't you think let us strive to know the lord his appearance is as sure as the dawn right the sure as the sun rising we say it all the time right he will come to us like rain, like the spring showers that water land. God is so certain. He's like the sun rising and the rain coming. Well, in Arizona, the rain is hardly certain, but you know, <laughs> for the most part, the rest of the world, rain comes all the time, right? The sun comes, the rain comes. God's that sure. Here's God's response. So interesting. What am I gonna do with you, Ephraim? What am I gonna do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist. And like the early dew that vanishes. Do you hear that? My love is like the sun rising every morning. Your love is like what? The morning dew, which is basically here for a couple minutes and gone. Your love fades. Your love isn't true. This is why I've used the prophets to cut them down. I've killed them with the words from my mouth. My judgment strikes like lightning. Why? For I desire faithful love or mercy and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So what's the context of the passage? The Israelites are going to God and saying, hey, hey let's turn to God. Let's go back. And God responds and says, I know your heart. And your heart's not in it. You're saying the right words, but your heart doesn't actually want to come back. Because if it did, 
you would know, I desire mercy, faithful love, not sacrifice. I want you to know me, not just give me burnt offerings. What is he saying? You see those religious practices you're going through. Don't miss it here, okay? God gave these things. God set up burnt offerings. God set up these things. Sacrifice. He set them up. They're his. They're good. They're, they're great. They're what God had intended for the Israelites to be doing. But what are they missing? They decided, I'm just going to do that and I'm going to ignore the rest. <laughs> I don't need to love you. I don't need to know you. I don't need to care about you. I don't need to show mercy to anybody or, any, or show love to anybody else. All I got to do is offer this bowl right here. And guess what? You're going to forgive me because you have to. Because as long as I do these little rules that you set up, as long as I do these little laws you set up, you have to forgive me. Because I'm playing by the rules. And it doesn't matter if I love you and it doesn't matter if I love everybody else because I'm doing what you said. Isn't that not exactly who the Pharisees are at their core? The Pharisees at their core are the people who are saying, Jesus, we do all the right things. You don't. You associate with tax collectors and sinners. We don't. You and your disciples don't fast, which is what we're gonna see in the next passage. We do. You and your disciples don't do this. We do. We, and they start listing all the laws. But Jesus knew your heart isn't for God. And it certainly isn't for the people around you. And that's what God wants more than anything else. So let's get into our lesson for disciples today and break it down. So here it is. It's not those who are well, who need a doctor, but those who are sick. So here's the big question. Is there anyone who is truly well, spiritually? The answer is no, All right? The answer is no, let me say that. Without Christ, you are not well spiritually. End of story. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us deserve his judgment. All of us are in the same boat. Every human being who's ever been born from the very first human beings in Adam and Eve all the way to the last human being, whoever that is in Revelation, right? Every single one of us, every single breath we've taken, we've needed a healer a chain breaker. We are the sick. But that's the creativity. The Pharisees didn't think they needed a doctor. They thought they were the righteous and the well. Right? We're not. So what does it mean to be a member of the sick, so to speak? To me, the most important piece of this, most important piece of this is being able to acknowledge that you need a doctor. Being able to be honest and say, God, I need you to break the chains in my life and free me from these things. We want to have a living and active faith that says, God, I want to be free. I want to have these burdens off of me. I want you to break these chains. I want to be with you. These things that I was doing are wrong and I want to live for you. Notice how with Matthew, what happens in the story? When Jesus comes to the tax collector booth and says, follow me, does he say to Jesus, absolutely, I'm with you, but also I'm gonna stay a tax collector. <laughs> this is my gig. I'm staying here. I like it. You know, I'm good. I'm staying a tax collector. Hey, you called me while I was a tax collector, so why can't I just stay one, right? Right? Obviously, I was good enough, so to speak, to get in just based off of that, right? That's not his response. What's his response? I'm following you, and he gets up and leaves. He says, I'm going to be with Jesus. He doesn't go back to that tax collector booth. He doesn't go back and say, I want to keep doing that. I want to keep ripping people off and hurting people. He goes and says, I want to follow Jesus. Had Matthew stayed at that tax collector booth, do you really, really believe that tax collectors and sinners that came to Jesus' house would actually have gone? If nothing really changed, he's the same old Matthew he was yesterday. He's here just like he was yesterday. There's no love change. There's no attitude change. There's no heart change. There's no mind change. He's just here. Do the tax collectors and sinners go to meet Jesus? No. 
But he got up and he said, I don't want that life anymore. I want Jesus. And who follows? All of them follow him. I got to meet Jesus. I got to meet this guy. You see, that's what we want. It's a both. It's a both and. I am the sick. So I can't go around saying to people with, with judgment in my eyes, you're going to hell because I said so. Instead, I want to speak truth and love and give them scripture and tell them the truth about sin and who God is. But it's not my place to go, man, I'm condemning you because I'm sick too. But then the other end is also real. When I get called by God to come be with him, I don't stay where I am. I leave where I am and I say, Jesus, I want to follow you and I want to help bring people to you. You see, it's a both. We don't get to just say, well, Jesus called me while I was a sinner, so I'm staying a sinner. I'm doing the same things I always done because you just need to show me grace and I'm gonna keep sinning on and I don't really care. And we also can't say the other side, right? I'm perfect, I've got it all figured out, no problems, everything's great. I know Jesus 100%, I love him 100%, I love everyone else 100% and I get the permission to just put everybody else where I think they belong, right? So here's what I wanna just bring to you this morning. It's a thought for you to process. Jesus, as the chain breaker, has freed you from something. And if he hasn't, can I ask you to pray and really consider what you're ignoring in your heart and in your mind that you need Jesus to free you from because you are the sick? But for those of us who know man, I was and am, and Jesus has brought me here. Can I encourage you to share your story on this? Can I encourage you to be honest with your kids? You know, one of the things I had to do in seminary, my first semester of seminary, I was in a class called Biblical Sexuality, and the thing that they had us do, the assignment they had us do in one of the first weeks of the class, we had to write out every sexual act we could remember that we participated in from the age of 10 all the way till now. We had to write it out in detail, as far as we could remember, every single bit of it. And then I gave that to Bree and had her read it, the whole thing. Everything I've ever done, every sin I've ever committed sexually, everything I've ever been through, my wife knows every single ounce in detail of all of it. And the beauty of that is, I said to her, I'm sorry because I sinned against you many, many times before I ever even knew you. And I asked her forgiveness and she forgave me. And my friends, that is, that's it. (laughs) And now we get to live a more free life knowing the truth, living in the truth and seeing how God has moved and forgiven us. When we're honest and we tell the truth and we say, this is where I've been. You gotta share it with your kids. You gotta share it with your wife. You gotta share it with your husband. You gotta share it with your church. You gotta share it with your friends. You gotta tell them the truth and say, this is where I've been. This is who I was. This is who I am. And Jesus has freed me. He has forgiven me. And he can forgive you too. That's where real change happens. That's where the gospel is. That's where the chain breaker works. Let me say this, the Pharisees who will come, not just in our church, but certainly I've experienced it myself, but in other environments too, maybe even in your own family, unfortunately. The Pharisees that will come and say, you've done this, you're unsavable. You've done this, how dare you? How could you tell me this? How, would, how are you doing, that? what kind of person are you? How, what's wrong with you? You need to know from the heart of hearts, from Jesus' mouth himself, the person condemning you, they're not being honest with themselves. It's just the truth. They don't know that they too are sick. And so they think they have the moral high ground. They think they can look at your life and say, I know this, this, and this, how dare you? But if you knew everything that they've done, if you knew everything that they have lived and said and been, and then you heard the judgment, you would say, not from you, only from God. And God has said in his son, I'm free. Pray with me. 
God, you are an awesome God. For so many of us, God, we just struggle because we want the glory. Let's be honest. We struggle because if I tell the truth, that people have power over me. If I tell the truth, then people might not forgive me. If I tell the truth, then people might judge me. If I tell the truth, who am I and what will they think of me and where will they cast me? Will they cast me out? But let us believe. God, let us believe. Let us have faith so strong by your spirit. Give us a faith. Give us a belief, God. Help us in our unbelief that we would be able to say and be truthful. Here is what I've done. Here's the Savior who bought me by his blood. And here's where I'm going. God, you're so good. I ask that you move on the hearts of the people listening and that someone's life is changed today. Someone's life is changed this week, this month, this year, and they come to know Christ because somebody decided I'm going to tell my story. I'm gonna tell the truth. I'm gonna be honest with my sin. I'm gonna acknowledge it before God and before every person I come in contact with because Jesus is the chain breaker and he has freed me from the power of death. God, be with us. Show us your love and your grace. Amen.